everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Jari Valanda. Hi Jari. Hey Joanna, how's it going? It is good. Thanks for coming on the show. Just a little introduction. Jari is a design engineer, entrepreneur, author and podcaster. Today we're talking about his book, The Entrepreneur Ethos, how to build a more ethical, inclusive and resilient entrepreneur community, which is something we all care about. So let's dive straight in. Um, first of all, Jari, I want to ask, you say in the book, not everyone can or should be an entrepreneur so what are the traits of those who do make it yeah I mean uh, that's a great question and I, I mean I wrote a whole book uh, about it the entrepreneur ethos but if I think about it and I kind of whittle it down to a couple of things that I think are the most important uh, the first is being comfortable with being uncomfortable mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the entrepreneur journey is unknown you just don't know if what you're building, what business you're working on, I mean, even as an author, right? Sometimes are people going to like what I write <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, whether or not authors like it or not, they are entrepreneurs as well. They actually have the exact same stresses. There's the exact same issues and challenges that entrepreneurs have. So I think it's really important to be really uncomfortable. Um, I mean, in really uncomfortable situations that you're comfortable zigging and zagging your way through it. Uh, that is, I think, one of the most important things in what I've found uh, in, my, in my journey as an entrepreneur. Uh, and then the second one sounds a little cliche, <laughs> but, uh, but I like it and it works and it's really enjoying the process and the journey. Hmm. Uh, as an entrepreneur, this is a hard job. The success is fleeting at most and you know hardly ever happens i mean you know if you look at massively successful companies they're what one percent of mm. of all, all companies so um the odds are pretty low i mean it's probably similar odds to being a best-selling author um i haven't quite figured that out yet but uh it's pretty low so if you don't enjoy what you're doing well, you know i think it's going to be a challenge so mm. i think those are those two things you know the Really, it's important to have a have a sense of things are going to go wrong. I need to be okay with that. I need to be able to zig and zag and figure out what I'm going to do. And then, you know what? You may never get to the end game. You may, may never get to the promised land. But if you're enjoying the journey along the way, then that's the reward. Mm. No, I, I agree with you. I, I do. I am encouraged by the fact that, as you say, 1% are probably less or the unicorn companies, yeah. as you say, in America. Yeah. Like if you ask people, name some companies, they'll have a few that they can name in yeah. the same way as authors. But that, that still means there's hundreds of thousands, millions of small companies that no one's ever heard of who are happily making a living, right? So yeah. you, you can be, let's say, a mid-list <laughs> entrepreneur, yeah, mid right? Exactly. Yeah. No, it's a great way to put it. I mean, we th this is the this is the reason why I wrote the book as well. So you can look at a lot of books about entrepreneurship, and they'll tell you all about how to growth hack and minimum viable product and one metric that matters and all the little external things. Uh, but not a lot of people write about the internal mindset. Uh, and really, the reason why I wanted to do this is because I was, you know, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of young entrepreneurs, a lot of minority entrepreneurs, a lot of women entrepreneurs, and they're really frustrated with not either not having the mentorship or not really understanding like, well, what does it take inside my soul? Like, what is it in here that really makes it makes a difference? And yeah, there's a lot of people that are very successful, quote unquote, um, that are mid level or, you know, they have their little deli business or they're like the garbage man or they're like whatever that are, you know, going to make a life for themselves. And then as an entrepreneur, what you really want to do is build this independent life that completes you and mm -hmm. completing you may not be, you know, the million billion dollar exit. It may just be. I'm my own boss. I can do what I want to do. I can take a nap at three in the afternoon. I can, you know, do these things that are important to me. So, yeah, that's you can be lots of different levels of success. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree with you there. So um, you talk there about some of the stresses and issues and challenges and the mindset. And one of the, the phrases you have in the book is this trough of sorrow, which yes. I really like. So can you talk <laughs> about the trough sure. of, of sorrow as it applies sure. to authors? 
Yeah, so I'm sure all of us have been in the trough of sorrow uh, when we're trying to figure out how to get, make our story that works. Um, so yeah, this was actually coined by Paul Graham. Uh, he was the founder of something called Y Combinator, and Y Combinator is one of the premier accelerators in Silicon Valley. Like, mm. lots of people go through it, and there's been lots of unicorns out of it. Um, and essentially he came up with this kind of graph on technology adoption and how how things come about in the world and this is a very kind of common theme among innovation um, any kind of innovation falls this sort of hype curve and the trough of sorrow is literally where technologies go to die um, this is the place where if you were to have the analogy of uh, walking through the shadow of death i shall fear no evil this is the sh walking through the valley of the shadow of death um, this is the place where you're either going to gain momentum and gain product market fit or it's just going to die on the vine uh, and for authors you can imagine this is you know, you got your draft done, you're trying to figure out if it works, you're trying to get either get an agent or get people to read it, or, you know, and there's various other places where this trough shows up. Like you release your book and nothing happens. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a really, really tough, tough place to be. And, and, and entrepreneurs know this like in their soul. And the reason is, is because we understand, and, and all entrepreneurs when they've done this a lot, they understand that a lot of this is luck. A lot of it's market timing, a lot of it's just like being at the right place at the right time, it's working hard. So for us, it's shots on goal. It's like, oh, that one didn't work, we'll do another one. We're wrapped up in the, in the process and we're wrapped up in the product to a certain degree, but we know the odds are really, really slim that whatever we make is gonna make it, quote unquote. And for us, obviously, as entrepreneurs in like the tech space, making it is billion dollar company exit or what have you. So um, we are very intimate with the trough of sorrow. Um, we don't like to go through it. Um, thankfully, since all of us have been through it before, and typically when you build a company, there's more people around you, uh, we share the burden. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, as authors, it's really hard to have a community, you know, of people that you can be like, yeah, it's okay. I know it's not selling well, or, oh, I know it's not working. You know, you can kind of commiserate. Um, you know, and, and we all remember like 1%, that's 1% make it, you know, that means that's a hundred companies, or if you're an author, that's a hundred books, like mm. you have a hundred books in you to write, <laughs> yeah, maybe not, but I mean, got to be up for that challenge. That's why I always say that it's this journey. And, and, you know, I mean, for me, it's been, you know, it's been challenging for this because, you know, I've done six companies. I've been doing this for over 20 years. You know, I've also written six books and it's, it's the ego inside you that you're like, how come this isn't working? What am I doing wrong? Hmm. What, why is Joe over across the street successful and I'm not? And that is a hard thing to swallow. And sometimes it's, you know what, Joe got lucky. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Or Joe wrote in a uh, best-selling genre or something. But um, you know, back on the on the mindset issues, that's ex that's what I call comparisonitis. That um, I'm comparing myself to to somebody else, and the imposter syndrome. Even if you do get some kind of success, do I deserve it anyway? So um, how how do we deal with with those things? Well, I mean, this is something I struggle with daily. I don't think there's a day that doesn't go by that I'm not like, you know, how come my book isn't number one in ethics when it's about ethics? I mean, it's <laughs> ethos is in the word, you know, like, ah, you know, and so, you know, or, you know, how come I didn't land the huge VC deal or, you know, all those things that you're just like, gosh, this is such a hard thing. And, and so for me, what I really tell myself every day is like, well, well why am I doing this? Like, really internally like it's not for the fame or fortune or praise that is all fleeting I, I could be the most wildly successful entrepreneur one day do the exit and then it's like okay now what what, mm -hmm. am, what am I gonna do now like okay yeah you may have all this fame and fortune but is that really fulfilling you can you really s sleep at night knowing what you did to have to get there is it worth the risk is it worth the suffering is it worth the sacrifice to all these things and so for me, the, the, the thing I always know, because I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, is like everyone's in the same boat. Even if you're wildly successful, 
you still have the same problems. You're still running up against the, can my business fail tomorrow? Um, can I hire enough people? Can I get enough money? It doesn't matter what level you're at. The, the problems are the same. But when you, as you ascend up, those get more complicated and there's a higher stakes. Mm. So, so for me, it's, it's a really a question of, yes, I would love nothing more than to have my book be number one. I know why a serv- servant leadership boot camp number one and I'm not, right? Like, you know, I'm, it's got the word boot camp in it. I know, it's got the word boot camp in it, right? So I'm like, okay, all right, calm down, take a deep breath, step back, right? I mean, you know, it's, 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 we can all relate. You know, we all see, we all know that person. You're like, how are they so successful? And then I, and then I think and I go, okay, let me turn that around. I mean, I had the honor and privilege of writing a book that I think is good. It's my art. It's my contribution to the world. I've put it out in the world. And after I've put it in the world, it's up to the world. I I have no control over that. Just like if I put a product in the market, I can work, 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 work. But if, you know, no one's doing blockchain anymore, which now blockchain is completely, you know, not passe anymore – no one's going to matter. I mean, I can't be the Uber of blockchain anymore because <laughs> nobody cares, right? I mean, honestly. So so, so <laughs> it seems a bit weird and a bit like, you know, you know, meta, meta, meta and, you know, like, oh, kumbaya. And again, I mean, I'm, I'm trying every day to live this way. And every day is a struggle because clearly there's, you know, I read a friend or I'm like, gosh, darn it. Like, why that person? And um, but then I realize you know what? I'm actually really lucky. I'm lucky to have had the community I'm in. I'm lucky to be part of, you know, the story grid universe. You know, we'll talk about it in a second. I'm lucky that I could publish books. I'm lucky that I have the discipline to write it. You know, and if someone says, how many books did you sell? I'm like, well, how many books have you sold? Or have you written anything? And I get that sometimes all the time. Like, why is it, is it worth it? I'm like, yeah, writing's worth it. Mm. Writing's worth it. if I'm the only one that reads it Mm. because that is my expression of my gift. What's my gift? My gift is telling these stories. My gift is giving of myself to the community for which I'm in. That's the highest honor you can give. If someone reads it, if someone pats me on the back, if someone gets on my blog and says, great post, that's all upside. That's gravy. That's, that's, that's all I can give, you know? Yeah. So. Well, it's interesting though, uh, coming, <laughs> I guess, coming back on the more emotional side, because um, this book does uh, have a more emotional side for you mm-hmm. um, and a personal meaning that goes way beyond uh, book sales. So um, would you mind talking a bit about that as well? Yeah. So, um, you know, The Entrepreneur Ethos was a, a book that I was writing uh, when my my late wife Jane uh, was had leukemia, and she was an entrepreneur uh, in the PR space. Um, and she would always complain to me about how you're a tall white guy, everything's easy for you. And us, you know, she was a female Asian, right? So <laughs> it's hard for us five foot two Asian women. And I'm all okay, okay. You know, I mean, you know, you still. She had obviously awesome traits that she did with her business. But, um, so she would talk. So I was thinking about, I got to write another book. I want to write another book. And she's like, well, you should really discuss how hard it is for minority and women entrepreneurs to get in the game. But more importantly, this internal mindset, because, you know, I was at a accelerator called 500 startups, my company at the time, lab sensor solutions, we were, you know, going through all the growth hacking and all the stuff that they teach us. And we were some of the older people in the, you know, in the batch that they call it. And we would be just getting all these questions. Hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? You know, you guys seem like you have your act together. <laughs> what is it about you? Again, like, it's funny. It's like, there is someone out there that you, you may be envious of them. Well, they're probably envious of you in some way. And, and that's another way to think about it. Like, oh, you mean there's actually someone out there that thinks that, wow, like that I'm this, you know, on this pedestal. But um, they, we started, you know, sort of talking to all these young entrepreneurs and it started to turn out that more and more it wasn't about how to 
define your minimum viable product. It wasn't how to growth hack Facebook. It wasn't how to grow your email list. It wasn't how to um, go to market strategy or get product market fit or all that sort of stuff. That was all done before. What people wanted to know was how do you get through the tough times? How do you fire someone? Mm -hmm. If you have a fight with your founder, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you balance your work and life? Do, is there a work-life balance? Should I be working 80 hours a week on my startup? What kind of hustle do I have to have? Um, what's, wh what's the difference between being assertive, aggressive, and an asshole? Like those were like these hard questions. And so I started interviewing a bunch of entrepreneurs that I knew and sort of came, came to this conclusion that really as a, as a community, we didn't have an ethos you know, mm. that our ethos was more externally focused, raise money, become a unicorn, exit, repeat. I mean, there, there was no like, how do we be a better community? How do we be more inclusive? How do we invite um, minorities and women to participate more? Because I mean, if you're a woman entrepreneur, you get one to 2% of all venture money. If you're a woman minority entrepreneur, you get like you know, 1% of the 2%. It's just mm. ridiculous that this isn't a job that one is race, gender, creed, nationality, sexual orientation. I mean, anyone can do this job. I mean, it's been proven time and time again, but it, it was looking more and more like this old boys club, tall white guys, and even tall white rich guys, you know, even people from the Ivies and stuff where you just there was really no access there was really no talk of that so i decided okay well you're the part of the problem or part of the solution you know live your truth so step up and here you go so that's it's, um that's fantastic and uh you know i know your wife didn't uh get to see the book done right but um it's great that you you did that now i did want to get deeper into the ethics side because in recent months we've seen in the author well not just in recent months over the years already we've had you know the i don't know if you remember the sock puppets the kind of fake reviews from a few years ago p authors setting yeah. themselves up as other um as yeah. other names we've had uh, plagiarism scandals happy recently um mm -hmm. copy paste mm -hmm. stuff we've had yeah. um yeah, you mentioned like the hacking. We've had kind of black hat stuff happening with um, yeah. Amazon stuff. So w there are ethical issues even in the author community, which let's face it is nothing as big as the big entrepreneur. So how do we do better? How and I, the thing is, the people listening are ethical people, as are we. We you know we're unlikely to have scammers listening. But what can we do to bring up the level um, of integrity within? In the community well I mean it starts with standards that everyone agrees to and it starts with a written down set of things we believe and in every professional community throughout history has had these sort of things lawyers have it doctors have it mm -hmm. engineers have it warriors have it I mean it's it's a universal thing that when a group of people get together that have the similar craft that it is in their best interest to make sure that the community is held to a high standard. I mean, it just is because what happens is if it's not, then the rest of the outside world will not trust the community. Like for entrepreneurs as an example, I mean, it's an honor to do this. I mean, we literally get told, go invent stuff, go figure stuff out. We know, we know that it's going to be hard. So we're going to give you a pass on some things. We're going to give you a pass on maybe some regulations. We're going to give you a pass on maybe your attitude. We're going to give you a pass that you're a little quirky and you can't like talk to people at cocktail parties and all you talk about is, you know, your <laughs> business. We're going to give you a pass on some of that. But then there's some things that society should not give us a pass on, like discrimination, like sex, sexual harassment, like unethical behavior where that trust that's put in us gets squandered. And so as an as a as a author community, I mean, we, we've even talked about this in the story grid community because there's a lot of unethical editors out there, too. I mean, every group is going to have their fair share of of a holes and, you know, D bags that are like, oh, God, do we really have to have them part of the tribe? Can't they can we just shove them out on an ice floe somewhere and <laughs> just go off into the sunset? Right. No one wants to own them because it's tough. Well, what's what's important is that a community 
have standards that everyone agrees to and that the community polices it. Because that's the only way you're going to get from an ethical kind of framework to an ethos type framework. So for me, ethics are the minimum bar. They're kind of like letter of the law. You know, well, it's not illegal, so I did it anyway. Okay, well, there's some things that are, you know, that are still legal but not ethical Mm -hmm. or even moral or even have aspire to a higher ethos. And so for me, an ethos is the top. Like, I want to be like the best of the best. So a community has certain people that are the best of the best, better, you know, writer, ethical, share. You know, there's a lot of people like Stephen Pressfield comes to mind as one of the people that I'm I, I look up to. And so how do you prescribe that? Well, you do it like every other group does. You put forth a set of criteria, you know, maybe one to two page ethos or mantra or, you know, I don't know, manifesto. I don't like the word manifesto. It implies other things. But, <laughs> but you, you know, you, you, you put forth like, hey, if you want to be part of the community, what do you think we value? And that's what I did. I mean, I, I, I actually asked entrepreneurs, well, what do you value? What do you think this community is all about? How do we build a more resilient, ethical and inclusive environment? How do we do this? And that's how we came up with the ethos. So, mm. I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe Joanna, we, we figure out how to do that for authors. I'm, I'm game <laughs> well, to write some questions down and let's, you know, get it done. <laughs> well, I would say the Alliance of Independent Authors does have an ethical author. Let's not yeah. call it manifesto, but it has yeah. a, a list of these are the things that I believe and I do. So, for example... I don't fake my reviews, you know, right. that, that right. type of thing. So I'll yeah. link to that uh, in in the show notes, which is fantastic. But since you mentioned the story grid, um, why don't you tell people why you're involved in the story grid and why you do the podcast? Because that seems quite different to your entrepreneurial self. <laughs> yeah. So um, the original uh, story grid uh, seminar, which was in New York, I think in 2016, 27 I forget I think it's 2017 uh, my my late wife Jane bought me uh, as sort of a birthday present it was in February my birthday is in February so uh, I had always been interested in structure of story of I'm an engineer so I love quantitative you know objective measures of things and I was also wanted to you know level up my craft and like be a better writer and and I was always running into these like real subjective ways to evaluate writing. You know, I'd go to like a creative writing class and like I write mostly nonfiction. There's some fiction stuff I write, but I mean, I was always get this eclectic, vague feedback on, I just don't really feel it, man. You know, whatever, like this weird, you know, (laughs) I'm sure we've all heard that. And, and, And it would frustrate me because look, I know, um, that with practice, you can get better. I mean, you can get better at anything with practice. Now, clearly you have to have some talent and maybe you don't have a lot of talent in some things. Like I'm never going to be a professional baseball player or basketball player, no matter how much I train, but I can still enjoy the sport and I can always get better. So I was looking for a way to get better. And uh, I found I found the story grid. In fact, Mark McGinnis, our mutual friend, sends me an email. And he says, did you see what these guys are doing? And I'm all, what do you mean? He's like, look, look, how, how come we don't know about this podcast? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Wow. Revelation. So, uh, you know, went there and then they had another training in um, that same year. I think it was September, October. Uh, and got certified as a sort of a story grid editor. And, you know, then that study group that we had um, became the roundtable. So the Story Grid Roundtable podcast is the five of us that were study partners. And, uh, yeah, I, it's interesting because, you know, people always say, oh, do you take editor, editing clients, you know, you, whatever. Do you, do you edit for a living? And I'm like, well, no. I mean, I write stories for a living um, as an entrepreneur, as a PR and marketing person, as someone that needs to convince people of my cool thing, Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to do that is to tell a better story than the next person. Mm -hmm. And how do you tell better stories? You learn about story structure. You learn what works. You learn what doesn't work. You apply that framework to your own writing and your own stories, and you practice, 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 practice until it flows like water. So anytime I go to like a 
a college or a group of entrepreneurs, and I, I typically will teach them about how to tell better stories and how to do more uh, narrative to, to describe what they do to investors and customers. Mm-hmm. Every time I, I, I bring a level or like what they call like a superpower to it because no one thinks of it like the way I think of it because I'm studying story structure. So not to say that not, there's not other people that do that, but boy, it's just helped me tremendously be able to look at a, a company or a client or a product and boil it down to, well, what's the story that's going to work with this? Mm. How are we going to convince people? Right? Yeah, it's such a good point. And I think authors forget that telling stories as part of marketing is, is the whole is the whole point. Yeah, that's that's that uh, marketing. Uh, no oh, one likes no, marketing. But, but it, it is interesting. <laughs> you, you should probably tell Sean to write Story Grid for business or something. It would be huge. Oh, like, oh like you're taking my idea. So <laughs> if that ever happens, I will give you credit. But I have thought about it. There, there's another There's another. Guy, yeah, um, story M- McKee uh, did Storynomics, and I went yeah. to that seminar, which was full yeah. of CEOs. And uh, as much as I like Robert McKee, um, I think the Story Grid for business would be would be better. So okay. you heard it here first. <laughs> If, if if Sean and I ever do that, we will give Joanna full credit as <laughs> an ethical ethos thing, and it will be thanks to Joanna for inspiring this awesome idea. <laughs> oh right, well I want I want to shift now um, to disruption because you're in Silicon Valley, you know a lot of these entrepreneurs. Yep. Disruption is the name of the game. It's just disruption, disruption, right? As soon as people get comfortable, something happens, it's disrupted. Now, back in 2013, Jeff Bezos said in an interview that Amazon would be disrupted. And what's happening now in the American politics is there's a lot of talk about breaking up tech, about surveillance capitalism, um, which mm-hmm. could potentially, you know, talk of breaking up Amazon, for example, if you own the store, you can't play in the store is something I heard from Elizabeth Elizabeth Warren, one of your politicians. So what do you think about this? How could Amazon be disrupted? I mean, it's already being disrupted. Amazon every day is getting disrupted and every day is losing ground because they're not as agile and nimble as they used to be. I mean, and, and, you know, this is actually... I mean, a really insightful question, and I'm glad you brought it up because this is a huge top of mind thing in the U.S. and I think around the world, especially when it comes to technology and automation, you know, self-driving cars and all those things that are going to literally disrupt millions and millions of people. So, um, you know, they did some analysis. um, I don't remember the name of the, 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 the blog post that did it, but they looked at the, the the hypothesis was Amazon's killing retail. Everyone that's in retail is dead. Mm. And they did a graph and they looked at Walmart, Target, Jet, Costco, and all these other things. And they're like, oh, they're growing just like Amazon's growing. In fact, some of them are growing faster. Why is that? Mm. And then you're like, well, why is Amazon going into brick and mortar? I mean, if retail is quote unquote dead, why on earth? With the biggest online retailer on the planet, maybe, you know, Alibaba is maybe a close second or first, go into brick and mortar retail. Like the worst business model, it's kind of like Elon Musk saying, yeah, I'm going to build an electric car. Stupidest idea ever because it is the dumbest idea ever until you build Tesla, right? So what's really happening in terms of like an Amazon disruption, in fact, they're being disrupted in their – web services side too with like Google, IBM, and Microsoft all have this cloud-based on-demand commute, compute farms, excuse me. Um, it, what, what happens in Silicon Valley and why disruption occurs is when the big juggernauts get lazy and compliant mm. and they don't serve their customers well, someone else sees a gap and says, I'm going to go super serve them and then I'm going to crush them. And you see this now, the edges of it, in something called Retail 3.0. And Retail 3.0 is all about on-demand, on-premises, and uh, online. So, I don't know, they, they, they have Target in the UK, right? Or is there a similar? We have similar type of retailer, yeah. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So Target in the US 
you can go online and buy something. You can then go pick it up or you can have it delivered or you can go into the store. So now it's the ultimate inconvenience for me as a consumer. I can shop around if I want, but sometimes people are just like, you know, I just need this now. That's the reason why Amazon's doing brick and mortar. They realize that there is a gap in their in, in their offering where if Jari needs a you know bottle of water, I'm going to go to the local store. I'm, I'm not going to get Amazon to ship that to me. And you know, Home Depot here in the U.S., Costco, you know, Jet.com, Walmart, all realize that this retail 3.0 thing is starting to take over, and that means there's a lot of places for disruption. And then there's some things that like Amazon will never do well. There's going to be some things where there is a component of service that has to be personal or local. You know, if you're buying eyeglasses or you have a pool or spa, you know, that's mm-hmm. another thing where it's like you need someone like if your pool screwed up, you're not just going to call someone on the phone. You want the guy to come out. And there's a whole ecosystem around that. So, yeah, I mean, Amazon will get disrupted. It's already being disrupted. It usually happens at the fringe and it usually happens when they're not super serving a specific customer and that customer gets angry and go- looks for something else. I mean, mm. that's the reason why Amazon <laughs> crushed it in books. That's yeah. the reason why. I, I mean, it's crazy, right? Yeah, I guess I'm thinking, I mean, I think those big changes are interesting, but for authors particularly, I'm um, interested in the disruption. For example, Google here in Europe has just been fined record 1.2 billion or something for mm-hmm. advertising their own products first, for putting their own search stuff first which is exactly what amazon is now doing with their books if you you know when you look for a book a pub amazon publishing or kindle kdp select books will be favored in some way it looks like we don't know that but when there's big fines like that when um the talk of uh you know can you be a publisher and own the bookstore and own the ads you, do you mm-hmm. think those are the things that authors who are listening care about more? Yeah. You know, wh- where's the disruption there potentially? So uh, a lot of times. So, yeah. So w- when it comes to like a marketplace um, and this is this has happened over time, mm-hmm. all all companies that get big and greedy want to take more and more of the pie. It's just it's natural. Um, there was a retailer here in the U.S. called Sears and Roebuck. And Mm -hmm. anyone that's my age will remember Sears and Roebuck. And it's like it was the Amazon of its day in the 1800s or early 19th century, had the, you know, catalog and all this great stuff. And then they went from the catalog, they went to the the store, and then the store had this stuff, and then they did insurance, and then they just all these sort of things. You know, now now they're bankrupt. Well, the reason why they're bankrupt and, and, and the reason why um, that sort of model breaks down over time is that people get angry. So I know you talk a lot about being independent and, and spreading around all of your assets. And, um, you know, I actually was listening to one of your podcasts and I'm like, you know, I got to write that down. I should be a little more independent and spread my, my assets around. Cause I'm mostly on Amazon, just to be honest, one, cause it's convenient. And two, that's kind of, until I started looking into this, that's all I knew. So as an author, the real important thing is, is that you need to control your intellectual property and you need to be able to spread that as wide as you can. And there will be services that will pop up because they're already popping up where Amazon is not going to be the main distribution channel for long simply because it's too restrictive. When when you are trying to control a marketplace and give your own things an advantage where you're like, okay, let's let the best thing win, over time people are like, they get mad. And then mm-hmm. enough people get mad, they're like, well, we'll just create our own thing. And people do that. So now now you've got – like podcasting is the best example of this. I mean even though there's Stitcher and Apple Podcasts and all these other things, like anyone can like produce a great podcast, put it out in the world – and try to gain people's um, interest. Now, the ultimate is someone you gain interest and someone gives you a way to directly communicate with them, like their email. Mm. You don't even get kind of who your customers are sometimes on Amazon. Like you sell a book through Amazon, you don't know that I bought your book. You have no idea. That's bad for you as an independent business. 
I want to know my customers intimately. I want to be able to say, hey, Joanna, thank you so much for buying my awesome book. I really appreciate it. You know what? If you tend five friends, I will give you this great little thing that only you have. Like now we have a relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and even like formula retail type want to do that. Once, once, once this starts to get so onerous – and people like that are independent, like I mean, Sean and um and and Steve, they have Black Irish books. Why did they have Black Irish books? Because traditional publishing, they didn't like the model. How come they're going to do you know more? How come the story grid stuff existed? How come you know Tim Graw, who you've had on your show? How come he do, the way he does book launch marketing and and book launching and stuff and his book, you know, Running Down a Dream? I mean, this is all the new reality. Like, yeah. Like Amazon, for example, is an important distribution channel. Is it the only important distribution channel? No. Will it over time, will there be other ones that will pop up? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because people are mad at them. Yeah. <laughs> and and when you get pissed off, people are like, let's build something, you know? And then you yeah. get, was it Kobo or Kobo up in Canada or whatever it is? Like, people are like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Well, and I think the surveillance capitalism, um, and if people haven't heard that term, it's really being talked about a lot now. That's what has made more people more angry and kind of moving into buying from different places. And it's interesting because I, I, w- I got the Kindle as soon as I could back in, you know, 2010 or whenever it was when the international Kindle, and it was the first one I could even buy. So they got me on day one. Yeah, but it's interesting because yeah. since Amazon moved to the advertising model, I don't I can't find books like I used to be able to find books so so as a reader I'm yeah. mad and for, it's so crazy the first time in well ever I now go on um, Apple books because they are serving me books that I want yeah. to read which is fascinating because I've not yeah. behaved like that as a reader before so I think you're right and if people listening like whatever you're mad about that's probably what will be disrupted it's a good yeah yeah absolutely I mean look look at you you know you're uh, what three and a half million people have listened to your podcast you know you've sold all these books right you 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 again admitted first one with the Kindle super excited and then and then over time they kind of wear on you right they're <laughs> yeah. like you know this doesn't seem fair because see most so most people are like I want a fair and just society or marketplace hmm. where the best thing wins. And over time, that happens. And then sometimes it gets, you know, we get to, you know, totalitarianism, right? So more and more control. And then people are like, no, 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 this isn't going to work. We need more and more freedom. And then it sort of ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows. And that's where disruption happens. And mm-hmm. I'll give you the, uh, the best example that I can think of right now. Um, Google owns search, mm-hmm. you know, you know, Bling and all those other ones are just, you know, Yahoo is all that. <laughs> well, people are mad at Google, because they track you, they serve you ads, they, they, they know everything about you. So there's this new search engine that's new as a couple years ago uh, called DuckDuckGo, hmm. right? I'm sure you've probably, see, so you've heard of it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we and, use it. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Brave, so, Brave is the other one. Yeah, so, so what, it's a search engine. How hard can it be? Like, you're, you're going against Google, you're going to get crushed. Well, no. Why? People are angry that Google tracks them. Duck, duck, go doesn't. There's a disruption. There's a new feature function that n- now a whole new group of people are like, my privacy is important to me. Therefore, I am going to forego the more convenient, better results at times Google search, and I'm going to search on duck, duck, go because I'm going to put my capitalism, my time and effort to something I believe in. Mm. And that's what authors need to do. Yeah, it, building your author platform is super hard. Yeah, the marketing part is is yucky. You know, you finish the book, you're half done. <laughs> and you need to now like tell people. But if you get into communities and if you are really a good, you know, like like you said, adhere to like some ethical and you know, eventually people will find you. And mm. eventually, the people that are constraining that and trying to optimize for their own benefit and not l- really letting the marketplace uh, sort it out, they'll go the way of Sears and Roebuck. It just happens <laughs> constantly. I mean, there's just time and time and time again. 
you cannot it the only constants change i know that again that's cliche but i mean i've seen it so many times and that's just accelerating so lots of opportunities, even if you feel a little frustrated now. Yeah, I think, and I, and I want to, you know, as ever, I'm a glass half full person. And I think, you know, there's amazing opportunities, but things will keep changing. Like, as yeah. you say, they have in the 10 years I've been in uh, the independent yeah. community. So um, we, yeah, we could talk about this all day, but we've run Good. out of time. So tell people okay. where they can find you and your books and everything you do online. <laughs> So you can find my books on Amazon, of course, um, because that's where they all are. And soon to be uh, wide. <laughs> and soon to be wide. I'm, I'm like really like got to like study the rest of your couple, your last couple podcasts. Um, so yeah, um, I, I'm on Amazon. I, I blog on the dailymba.com, which is my tips, tools, and techniques for entrepreneurs. Um, I co-host a uh, podcast called the story grid editor roundtable podcast with valerie francis Anne holly kim kessler and leslie watts who are some of the smartest people i know on story and uh you know everyone says you know if you're the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room mm -hmm. well i am literally in the right room on a roundtable podcast so <laughs> it is such it's been such a great joy to you know be with them and like learn what they learn and 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 really that has just been a kind of mind expanding experience. And and as an entrepreneur, sometimes we get kind of down in the weeds on our product and all the fancy dancy stuff and, you know, we're crushing it or whatever. And just to sort of step back and look at the creative creative side and figure out how to tell my story better, you know, figure out how to uh you know, I'm like writing a memoir right now about my life with Jane and I would never have been able to do that without the story grid and the support of the community and, you know, authors like you listening to how you, you, you do things and how your, your mindset and, you know, McGinnis as well. I mean, he's just been a mentor to me for, I think almost 10 years. <laughs> so it's been a long time. <laughs> and, you know, even Sean Coyne and Stephen Pressfield and all, and Tim Grawl and all those people that have been really giving. And I just hope to, to give, give as much as I get. So fantastic well thanks so much for your time Jari that was great I appreciate it thank you